everyone, and welcome to our Undoing Radio. We are continuing our series on the meaning uh, behind the word sacred and all of its facets with various people from various walks of life. And I'm here with my friend, Willie, uh, who represents the, um, what would you say, pre-Tahitian, ancient Hawaiian understanding of that? Is that Would that be correct? Yeah. Somewhat. Okay, so first, just let people know how it is that we are even having this conversation. I mean, what, what is, where does your understanding come from? By way of that which is sacred, is uh, my understanding to address that issue. Mm -hmm. My family comes from a time before the Hawaiian kingdom. They come from a time of the first Hawaiian people. And in this time, there were no such word as anything being sacred. The, uh, not as the kind of sacredness as we see it today. For them, for those, the first people, the sacredness of things was that which was in you, that God inside so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, that everything external, everything outside was just the way of the earth, where sacredness was the way of self and that power that is within. So today when I'm talking to people in Hawaii that are speaking of things being sacred, uh, this sacredness is always seeming to be something directed outside of the self. For instance, uh, a mountain that is sacred, a river, a forest, a pile of stones. We have in, in this time acknowledged sacredness with those things outside of ourselves. And this seemed to be the trend today. But yesterday, and in the time of my parents and grandparents, uh, this was not so. They more addressed the issue of sacredness as the power within, the latent power, that which we all have, every individual, every person, young and old, male or female, the power within. So when we talk about people who look at something external and, and get a feeling that they interpret as sacred. Uh, did your, could your parents and grandparents, could they relate to that feeling of looking at a beautiful mountain and, and whatever that feeling is, having that feeling, or did they not have that feeling? Oh, they did. In many instances, just the sight of a rainbow kind of lifted their spirit to, to having them question its source. You know, where did it come from? What is it? It is not something very usual. It occurs at a very special time under very special conditions. So having to have that knowledge, at, at least, uh, they tend to immerse themselves in the beauty of it, the power of it, to be something that is in this place that we live. Mm. So they acknowledge that that is something uh, pretty much gifted to us as inhabitants of this land. Would the first people have been confused by, uh, for instance, the Tahitians coming with their sense of ritual, their sense of the sacred, the gods and, and all that? Would they have been confused by that or no? Oh, no, uh, I don't think they were confused of it at all. I think what confused them was the, the idea that we had no leadership. We had no gods or goddess. We had no knowledge of power outside of ourselves. So, so this is what they, they wanted to bring with to us is that, hey, look, we have gods and goddesses, we have tikis, we have temples, and all you people need this stuff in order to acknowledge uh, the gods and goddesses and powers that are here in the world today. So 
all of that seemed to direct itself to things outside of ourselves, which kind of confused my people a lot because prior to them being told, prior to them having to see any of these temples and stuff, everything was within. It was not a matter of anything being outside of ourselves. But now with the Tahitians and the new ways, uh, it's bringing about a new kind of belief system where there's a big shift inside of the people now to believe things outside themselves, to acknowledge the gods and the goddesses and not the god and goddess within. Mm. Uh, now, we were sort of talking about this a little bit at breakfast and maybe this comes in here. Uh, because you had mentioned late, that it's a latent energy that resides in all of us and that this externalizing of the sacred is a ritualization around it, uh, you see as a form of evolution. Is that right? I think uh, in, in a very good way, it, we have evolved. And yes, it's a kind of evolution. We, uh, from where we were to where we are, have been a big change. Uh, and how we look at things uh, a long time ago, we, we, we don't do that anymore. We sort of uh, look at that which is here and now. So, uh, yes, a lot of change. Do you think it's possible in, in this modern world to, uh, to go back to the latent energy, to get back in touch with the sacredness within? I think today, even in this time, uh, we all look for an energy form that's going to help us do our work, that's going to help us in the healing of others, that's going to help us in the healing of ourselves. And in order for us to do that, we need to go back. We need to go back to a time when these so-called latent energies were very much alive and very much practiced and very much able to heal self or others. So we want to do that today. We need to go back. We need to take a step back and embrace the powers that were uh, and hold fast to that so we can do a lot of good work for humanity. Mm -hmm. When, uh, when the sort of two cultures, the Hawaiian the, or pre-Tahitian culture and the Tahitian culture mixed together, did, did that knowledge get lost uh, on the whole? Or was it, I mean, clearly your family has known this forever, hasn't lost the thread. Are there a lot of families like that? Or um, was it just done away with? Uh, Assimilated, uh, I guess, is the word. When change came about, many of the families of Hawaii uh, chose to go underground. So they did, and the only time that they would speak of things would be to their own family. It was not really shared with others. Uh, our culture in itself was stifled by uh, newcomers that brought new ways of doing things and forbid the practice of, of uh, old, so to say. So many of the olden things just slowly, slowly went away from us. The elders spoke less and less about it, trying to keep us safe. Uh, so a lot of the ancient arts were lost in this transition. Mm. Uh, one of the things that we also sort of talk about privately that may have to do with this, I guess, is... Um, People see sites that are ancient, ancient sites, um, and you went and visited one recently and, and talked about the energetic nature of it and your impressions of it. And I had asked you, well, is that a sacred space? And you said no. So when people see these ancient places and they, again, they feel something, they maybe sort of psychically intuit something about the place and, and what its operation is about, uh, what is it that they're feeling that's separate from the sacred? I think most of what we feel today is not an idea of that which is sacred, but simply something that touches us in awe, something that surprises us, something that 
that leaves us with a thought like, oh, wow. You know, being caught in that wow moment seemed to be somewhat of uh, uh, of something very sacred. Because we don't feel that every day, and yet here it is. But in old and ancient time, when a place was significant enough to be a place of study or a place where people can come to speak of things, the discoverer or the one that acknowledges this is the place for such a thing would normally ask his family or his friends that when he dies, when he passes away, that let his bones be buried here in this place, that he can oversee and protect this place of knowledge till the end of time. So that in itself seems to, in modern day, be somewhat sacred. As we know, in modern time, many churches are built in places where churches once were, and in the floors and in the building somewhere are bones. So the same applies here in Hawaii. Huh, that's interesting. So people could be feeling literally the spirit of people who are there and mistaking that as sacred. Yeah, and... Uh, it stands and it rings true in olden time that many places that were very unique and very special would also have the bones of the old people that are buried there as guardians to to be there for us in the here and now. And so, and maybe even a place like Hawaii, uh, because one thing that you've talked about publicly, I think, is that... Um, uh, someone in the family down the line would have to make the words to sort of set the spirit free and say, okay, you've done your work, time to go home. Uh, but if you've lost that knowledge, then that spirit is just there. So if Hawaiians have lost their ability to make those words or forgotten how to make those words, then that means there are a ton of spirits, right, still on the island doing their work which makes this place sort of more alive than uh, perhaps other places in that way. Uh, that was an issue I began learning as a very young boy, and it got me so curious that I asked my dad that these so-called spirits that are here and about, how long will they be here? How long will they walk the earth? And he looked at me and he said, till the end of time. And I asked him, why? Why is that? Why are they here? Why are they here till the end of time? He said, because when they were alive, they gave their word and they commanded their spirit to be here and to do that which they are here to do, even that they should die doing it. So the spirit is already committed and is already commanded by words to, to be here till the end of time. Mm. So we see these random spirits here and about, I'm very sure in other parts of the world, uh, it is so mm -hmm. that every now and then we would see them, hear them, feel them. Mm. And it's not unusual. I want to veer slightly off topic, maybe, um, to uh, something else um, we talked about, which is Ava. People know this as Kava. It is a drink that uh, now, nowadays is completely watered down and sort of makes you numb and feel good. And I had heard that this was what the uh, Hawaiian chiefs would, would drink. They'd come together and they would drink this before they would ever go to war so that they could sort of calmly talk about things. But you're even farther back in history 
uh, perspective on this, I think is fascinating um, and, and actually gets to the heart of um, how, you know, how I hear people talk about hallucinogens, how they use hallucinogens to, um, to open doors to other worlds, to sacred spaces and, and all of this stuff. But here in, in the case of Hawaii, actually, you know, Kava or Ava had a completely different use. Uh, so I'll just set that up. And, and if you could just tell us what that was. <laughs> uh, Kava or Ava is a, a plant here in Hawaii that is made into a concoction, uh, pounded and chewed. And, and uh, the juices of this plant is a, uh, uh, will put you in a kind of a coma, would put you in a dream place where you will dream for as long as this, the strength or the power of this plant is in your system. So a cupful of this brew could take you out into a dream for about a week. And for that week, you are in a coma. You are in a comatic dream. There's no way out. If you're caught in a nightmare, that nightmare will continue. <laughs> or if it's a good dream, then you're in a good place. I can share a little bit of what my dad shares with me. And he says it's not so much to allow this drink to intoxicate you. It's not so much to allow this drink to put you in a chromatic state, dreaming endlessly. The preparation is to put yourself in a good place where nightmares would never come. So it's a matter of disciplining the self and programming your journey. And then when you begin to drink this brew, it's not a matter of how fast you can go into the dream state, but actually slowly to enter the dream world as slow as you can. So drinking it, you had to be so disciplined in order to, uh, to not allow the effects of this uh, plant to take, take over you, but yet for you to have complete control and to allow the, uh, the drug to work with you very, very slowly so you can enter into your dream slowly, stay in your dream place slowly, and then finally allow the drug to do its work. So holding it off, staving it off, is the discipline. Right. Yeah. And that discipline uh, speaks of yourself. It speaks of the inner self's ability uh, to be able to, to outride the effects of the drugs. Yeah, that, see, that, that to me is really interesting because that is the antithesis of what the so-called psychonauts think that this plant medicine is about, at least as far as it comes from South America. So now I'm going to have to wonder, you know, do these South American shamans who bring people over to do these things as spiritual retreats, do they know what the people coming don't know, which is it's not actually for that. Mm. It's the opposite. It's to build the self up to stave off the effects of the drug, not not go into these crazy worlds. And yeah, it takes a lot of self-discipline to be able to do that. And without the discipline of self, you're going to succumb to the drug instantly. So in this practice of self-disciplining, uh, regardless of the drug's effect, it's going to help you in the everyday world as you begin to face things that require a greater concentration of self and energy. So, so for my people, the, the Ava stands as a symbol or as an item in order for you to practice the, that measure of self-discipline. Mm -hmm. So if the self is, the, 
the person is sacred. The sacredness comes from inside, and 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 I get a, the sense of that makes sense with this discipline, all of this disciplining the self and building the self. Where now, when we think of self in America, in the West, and we think the ego, um, what did the self actually mean to your parents and your your family? When you come across something, and then all of a sudden, you know. You know that this is so, because nothing else makes any other sense. That's the self. You know, it's not a matter of thinking that you know, it's knowing that you know. Mm -hmm. The self. It's like saying that uh, if you're sick, if someone else is sick, the body does not need your permission to heal. The body already knows what's wrong and what needs to be done to correct it. The body, without your permission, will make all of the antibodies all of the nutrients, all of everything that the body will need to fix that sickness. All it needs from you is to get out of the way. So the discipline of self is a matter of learning how to get out of the way, how to trust self that self knows what to do, when to do, and how to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is the, uh, you know, sort of the, the goal of spiritual people from the West to the East, which is um, we, we tend to think that the thinker who gets in the way is the self, you know. Uh, but you're saying, as they all see, uh, masters, so-called, in quotes, say, uh, which is the self is that direct action, not the thing that gets in the way and makes the decision. Um, so it sounds like, you know, your ancestors and, and maybe your parents too lived in that state. Would that be fair to say that they lived in a, their mind was of direct action where they weren't in the way of their doing? Uh, they knew and understood, uh, a lot of uh, the energy forms, and there are many forms of energy, uh, they grew up with it, they understood it, they practiced it, uh, and it became very much a way that they lived. They lived in, in that complete knowledge of knowing uh, what energy is best suited to accomplish this or that or that. Would this be something that I need to think about with my mind? Would this be something that I need to enhance spiritually? Would this be something that I need to call uh, from another place for spirits to come and to help me? So all of these uh, scenarios, all of these uh, riddles, are, are they knew and understood them, so they knew exactly where to go to get the medicine they need. It's, uh, and they took it just like that. They never went anything further. Uh, tapping ready sources that are here, already here, had been here. And they knew how to do that. They, they know that once there's a shift in mind, uh, everything in the body changes. It's like, watching someone smile and wondering, why is he smiling? And then allowing that smile to touch you and feeling the warmth or the, uh, the joy that this person is really happy. And then it begins to make you happy to see such a thing. Mm -hmm. you know, this is, is energy sources that are here every day that when we 
touch it, it touches us. Mm. It changes us. It changes the chemistry that is flowing in our body that quickly. Mm. Yeah. Uh, did your parents, did they tell you stories in the same way that, um, you know, we hear Hawaiian chanting or, you know, even the stories of the gods or anything, did, did they tell you metaphorical stories for you to learn things or how did that learning process go for you as a kid? All of the learning was a story, every bit of it. If it was not a story, it was some kind of a riddle. And if not that, it was some kind of a unsolved mystery. But it was all about a story. Mm -hmm. And this is how uh, they want you to understand it. It's not a, 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 like a student sitting in a classroom learning it with a textbook. It was more a story being told. And then you having to pick up from that story what fits what don't fit, what you can use, and what you cannot. So this was the process. There are times when uh, there are certain things that they want you to remember it verbatim. They want you to remember it word for word. And when those times come about, they will tell you, be without your eyes, be without your ears, be without your mind. Listen to remember. So in these moments when they are saying these things, more like a chant, it's telling you to put everything aside, clear, empty your mind, listen to every word and remember it for the rest of your life. Other than these little instances every now and then, the rest is just a story. Hmm. Hmm. Did they have a story for the sacred? Or the, the, the sacredness inside? Did they have a story for that? Oh, they have lots of riddles. They give you a riddle like, can you remember where you were before you were born? A simple riddle, can you remember where you were before you were born? So where were you? Yeah. How old were you when they asked you that? Oh gosh, I was probably about seven. What did you do with that question? I didn't know what to think of it. I thought, you know, well, I've always been here, but that was not true. There was a time when I really wasn't here. <laughs> so it took many years to, uh, to try to solve that riddle, as simple as it was. I uh, had an experience, uh, and we're talking about that in particular, where, where was I before I was born? Anyway, uh, my wife become pregnant with my son. And just for fun, I wanted to find out exactly where he was because he was not yet born, but he was in my wife's tummy. So one day I held my wife and the baby, and I said to myself, where are you? And instantly, I was in a place looking around me like, wow. It was like being in the middle of the universe. Stars were everywhere in the dark of night. And every now and then would be a streak of light going across the darkness. And I thought, 
Wow. And no sooner than I thought, wow, I was here again. And I looked at this and I said, is this where you are? Is this where you are? I could not help but believe it to be true. The journey was so fast. And the expanse of space was so big. The universe was so big. Mm -hmm. Never in my wildest dreams could I ever conjure up anything like that. I said, wow, because it was a very wow moment. Mm -hmm. And then months and months later, she was now near having to birth the child. She was now in her ninth month. And again, I thought, well, I made this journey once. Let me see if I can make this journey again. So again, I go to my wife and I hold her tummy. And I close my eyes and I say, where are you? And again, I was in a place of swirling colors. Wow. I was a bit dumbfounded. I was a bit confused because I thought for sure I was going to enter into a place of stars and, and darkness and light blue and black. But now I was in a place of colors and swirls of colors, pinks, purple, orange, blue, all kinds of different shades and colors, just swirling, swirling everywhere, mixing and blending and swirling. And I looked at this and I said, oh my God, is this where you are? And again, I awoke. He was now in a place of many colors, in a place of flashing lights, an exploding uh, matter of things everywhere. It was so far-fetched. But yet, myself believed it to be true. So here he was, before he was born. And there you were. Yeah. So having to have this as my experience, I can only feel as though my journey was very much the same way. That when I started, it was just a little light in the universe, yeah. surrounded by mostly darkness, blacks and blues, and starlit skies, streaking meteors, flashes of light. But as I came closer to a time to be here, it was a swirl of colors, a different place. So one must experience a few things to, to solve these particular riddles that the old people share. Well, and I'm sure it was a long haul between the age of seven and uh, your son. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> but it was a very beautiful experience, okay, and yeah. I, I really cherish that. But it's interesting that that's the length of time that these riddles, you know, sometimes these riddles, uh, it's going to take a few decades before they flower, before the, you know, the answer becomes you. Um, I, I find yeah. that interesting, and, you know... It again gets to the the sense of time, the different sense of time. You know, we have the linear sense of time here, and um, they just didn't have the same sense of time at all. They don't too much dwell in things of the past, but they do hold to certain things said, and they do hold to their experiences. They're more people of now, thinking of tomorrow. Well, do you think that that uh, telling stories of how things are mm. as a family and also, um, well, I, I mean, really even just that uh, affects one's sense of time. Um, 
what that and the fact that spirits are still with you are still around. The ancestors are still here. You know, all of this affects the sense of time because if everything is right now, if all of your history is right now being told to you in stories and, and if uh, the ancestors are still here, then everything is right now. We don't have, I didn't have that growing up. So that's that. I think that would be, um, I don't know. I just find that interesting that, that there, there's this completely other mind that we, um, uh, that are two minds that are living parallel side by side on this planet. We all we all think of ourselves as one humanity, and at heart we are all one humanity. But in mind, um, it's just amazing how how different we can sense the world and time, even just something as basic as time or the sacred. Yeah, I don't even have a question. I'm <laughs> just here. You're wowing me. Yeah. Uh, uh, Oh gosh, I just had a thought in my mind, but it drifted away listening to what you're saying. But well, maybe I'll just ask you one more thing, just to sort of tie it together, um, because we, I'm sure you've heard of sacred geometry. I'm sure maybe you've heard of sacred time, sacred numbers, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and people think of texts as being sacred. Mm-hmm. Would any of that apply to your ancestors? Um, even if they didn't, for instance, have texts back then, would they have recognized something sacred about a text or about numbers or about geometry if they saw it? Uh, their knowledge of things, I'm going to say, their knowledge of things scientifically uh, was very poor. Things in their lives were not so much about science. It was all about nature. Nature dictated, nature uh, nature directed how they are to behave. You know, when the storm comes, take shelter. Lava comes, get out of the way. So it was all nature uh, speaking and their interpreting of nature, having to live in it, having to survive in it. So, yeah, this is how they... They lived. It was not a matter of science or anything else. You know, just having to feel and know things. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Willie, thank you for doing this. Thanks again for sharing so much of your life. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs>